All right, awesome. Well, let's get started here. Obviously, we want to make sure that we uh, stay within the time frame and, and really be cognizant of everybody's time on here. Looks like we do have a few attendees, and typically people will start coming in as, as we go as well. So just as a, a warm-up um, and intro of myself, and then I'll let Richard kind of introduce himself, and I know you've got some other views, and then we'll hop right into um, – you know, the five characteristics of effective websites. But first, my, my name is Brandon Cockrell. If I haven't had a chance to meet you, um, hello, if I have. Great to have you here. Uh, what I am over the Small Business Council with the Sandy Springs Chamber of Commerce. And these webinars, these workshops are ways that we're trying to get out to the small business community, Sandy Springs Perimeter Chamber members, in order really to provide takeaway value. Um, and these are also going to be up on the Facebook page, but also on uh, the Chamber website as well, so that uh, you can go back and watch it, rewatch things in case you might have missed something thing or anybody who's not able to attend live, at least they can go back and watch it. So what I wanted to do, and I know a big hot topic that we have amongst the small business community is websites. And are they effective? Are you getting what you should be getting out of website, out of your website? And that's what we're going to touch on today. And if you have any questions, please feel free to raise your hand. We'll try to get you on um, you can actually speak on here if you'd like to, or if you just want to put the question in the comment um, section, I will be monitoring that so that then we can bring that up. We want this to be interactive. Uh, obviously, we've got certain key points that we want to go over, but our main goal is to, to keep this interactive, answer questions, and uh, really help out and provide value any way we can. So um, before we go any further, Richard, would you like to go through a little bit of background of yourself, what, you're, what you've been doing over the years, what you're, what you're doing now, um, and then we can kind of hop into the, to the meat and potatoes of everything. Uh, sure. Yeah. Um, let me just say, uh, Brandon, I want to thank you for having me on. It's an honor to be with you all this afternoon, and I want to respect your desire to be serious about your uh, website. I just want to say a couple of things first before I get into myself is that, um, you know, just one thing to think about is that websites just aren't the novelty that they were back in the 90s. And um, if you were alive in the 90s, but um, these days over 48% of people check out a company's website to determine, you know, whether they think their uh, business is credible or not. It doesn't matter who refers someone to you, whether it's a friend, a coworker, a family member, uh, an advertisement piece, it really doesn't matter. They're going to go to your website to judge you. And your website is the 21st century brick and mortar. So uh, just some other stats to kind of share with you is that 30% of people won't consider a business unless they do have a website. Four out of five people use search engines, of course, to find something local. And then, I didn't realize this until a couple of months ago, but 63% uh, of people use a company's website to engage in dialogue, whether it's chat, email, or text. So your website really is a hub for a lot of communication between you and you know, your clients. So I kind of wanted to share what I've learned, the uh, five characteristics of an effective website. Uh, but uh, to get back to kind of what Brandon was saying, let me just share a little bit about uh, myself and that I was going to, let me just switch over here because I wanted to change. Sorry why I just click a bunch of buttons here and show you my desktop. But um, yeah, I just want to say that I was, uh, I grew up in uh, Orlando, Florida and uh, I pretty much was an indoor kid my you know entire childhood and uh, even some of my teenage years, I spent most of my time indoors. I was usually drawing or building models uh, as a kid. Not a very glamorous thing to do, but you know that was me. That's what I was interested in. And uh, by the time I was twelve, uh, my dad got upset with me for rooting for the Michigan Wolverines. They, uh, my dad grew up in Miami, and uh, I didn't like the the Canes logo. My parents met in Tennessee, so they rooted for Tennessee all the time. I got nothing wrong. I got nothing against Tennessee. I just didn't like the orange color. And um, 
So I looked at colleges and evaluated them based on their branding. I was 12 years old. This is what I was looking at. And I landed on the Michigan Wolverines. I liked the colors, the mascot, the helmet. And this was the 70s. So they were winning a lot. And, um, but as I got older, I did get out and start exploring the you world. Really, you really went out on a limb picking Michigan uh, to make sure you were rooting for a good team. Well, I'm telling you, this, just to give you a, the framework of how my mind works is, uh, you know, I rarely, I have no idea how they're doing these days. I just know that if I've got to pick something, I'm going to be looking at branding. I'm going to be paying attention to how it's laid out, how it's presented. And that's what I've always been interested in. And, uh, and again, this was the seventies. I was 12. So I hope you'll cut me a little bit of slack. I got it. I'm just giving you a hard time. Yeah, that's cool. And, um, but as I did get out and start uh, exploring the world, I did quite a few trips, uh, usually serving trips with uh, a local church or an outreach organization, which uh, took me down the Amazon River. I was in Sri Lanka to help after that tsunami. Um, Christmas, was it 2004, I think it was? Um, been to Malawi, Kenya, Afghanistan, Guatemala, India. And then uh, did, then I did do some traveling just as uh, recreation. It sent me to China, Singapore, uh, North Vietnam, Dubai, Europe. So I've, I've been able to be on five of the seven continents. So it's, um, it's a show. And one of the things I would always pay attention to is artwork, advertising, and uh, because the advertising is is so uh, pervasive, I mean, it's, it's just, it's everywhere. And a lot of it is built in to be subtle. And uh, because uh, you want to blend in and hit you subconsciously. So there's, you know, the two different types of uh, marketing, you know, the subliminal and then the in your face kind of stuff. And a lot of people try to balance between the two so that they always say top of mind. And um, so all this experience or this passion that I had led me into, uh, into a few ad agencies. And then I ended up at one ad agency in Orlando. It was a national car ad agency. We were doing um, those full page car ads for um, uh, dealers throughout the country. And I quickly moved up to an art director position there. It was over uh, six or seven people. Did that for a while before moving on to the Orlando Sentinel. And um, you know, the one thing about newspapers back then, anyway, this was uh, the, the 90s, that um, there was about 1,500 people working there at the paper. And the newspapers offer more than just newspaper ads. They work with all their advertising clients to help promote them. That means that we worked on uh, direct mail pieces, brochures, presentation materials, advertising campaigns, magazines, posters, yeah, and the list goes on. I was responsible from concept to completion for all the projects that I managed. That gave me the, ter the chance to work on advertising materials for hundreds of different clients at that time. Uh, and not being satisfied with just doing print work, in the evenings I would freelance uh, and learn, do, learn to do interactive media. I don't know if you guys remember back in the day the interactive CD-ROMs, but I created a few of those, including one for uh, Marshall University. Also did one for uh, Chick the Chick-fil-A Bowl here. That was in the late 90s, early 2000s. But uh, I was also doing websites and online advertising for those animated ads that you see on the sides and tops of pages of um, commercial websites. When you see those little banners or uh, on the side or in between the text, uh, I would do quite a bit of those. But by the mid 2000s, I had become a lead on a website building team initiative that the Orlando Sentinel had started. And uh, we quickly had a successful team of seven people designing and developing over 150 websites in the course of a few years. Then Chicago, the Orlando Sentinel was owned by the Chicago Tribune. When the Tribune took notice of our success, they decided they could do um, half a good a job and charge twice as much. So it really restrict, re, being restricted by their bureaucracy, uh, we ended up uh, drawing up 
pretty quick. And in less than a year, we had, we weren't getting any new clients and we were losing the ones that we had. But toward the end, they ended up letting everyone go except for me. I was left to manage over 70 existing websites on my own for about six months before they outsourced that. And um, so it wasn't long before I left. Yeah, that sounds um, terrible. Yeah, it was a, it was a, but by, by the time I left, when I started there, there was about 1,500 people working there. Yeah. And by the time I left, there was about 250. So. Oh, wow. Well. Yeah. Depressing. That doesn't sound fun. No, it was a pretty depressing. Um, <laughs> yeah, I figured that. So, um, yeah, just seeing a bunch of people leave. And so, um, but, uh, but the good thing was, I think, you know, I, by the time I had left, I had, you know, I've been working with, I had to be well over a thousand different clients and, and, you know, hundreds of different uh, industry categories. And um, I developed, I designed and developed over 30 websites on my own while I was part of that team. And uh, everything from you know, automotive stores, uh, I had an exterminator, uh, did I think one or two hotels, a grocery store. Um, There's one guy who had a personal protection service and uh, did one for a funeral home, and uh, and I just a bunch. So, but uh, so you know what you're doing. I've been doing it a long time, and I pretty much jumped in with both feet. And uh, yeah, so I, I think I've got a well, lot of experience with a lot of different uh, industries. Well, you've uh, you've sold me. So let's 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 uh, let's jump into it and see if we can. Uh, help some people out here because I definitely, obviously, um, you know, I've known you for a few years now, I guess it's been, and uh, I, I still have yet to come to anybody who's been able to provide the level of detail, the turnaround time, and the knowledge that you have. So, um, love you going through that. Uh, definitely letting everybody know a little bit about you and what you've got going on. And so, now it looks like let's let's hop into to what we're saying. Yeah, the, um, why I came up with the five char uh, characteristics of a, of a, an effective website was because I just believe first impressions matter, and with that, you know, with the website being, you know, your majority of your um, clients, existing clients, and new clients' first impression, you know, this is um, it's an important uh, important thing to tackle. Yeah. So, you know, we focus on, um, you know, doing like focusing on doing trend setting designs and, you know, walking people through step by step and being very transparent with everyone. So uh, I'm just going to, yeah, let's just jump into the first one is going to be layout design. That's uh, what I find to be that the, you know, one of the most important is because that's the user experience. It's, um, it's like getting ready for a date. You put on your best shirt, best shoes, you know, best watch, or, you know, at least me, I've got, a, I've got too many watches. I need to pare down a little bit, but. Uh, and, one, and Richard, hopefully you don't mind me kind of hopping in here just with questions and, and yeah. stuff like that. You know, as far as like, layout whenever you and I, you're probably going to touch on this so i may be uh, you know jumping ahead of it but as far as layout like what is that obviously you as a developer somebody that's in it understands that my myself even though you know i'm in digital marketing and we work a lot in this field but whenever you uh discuss layout are you really talking about the the ease of use for customers who come to your website? Are you look, talking about, you know, just visually working well together or, or looking good on mobile? I mean, what, what would you, uh, going into detail about that as far as a layout's concerned? I mean, what, what would you, and I apologize if I'm jumping ahead, but what? No, uh, this is, this, um, yeah, because the layout design actually encompasses so much that it's, um, you know, we could spend the entire time just talking about the layout design because it does incorporate the it design. It incorporates the navigation, how it's laid out, you know, the different call to actions. It takes into account 
your logo, the colors of your brand, the, um, the quality of the graphics that you use, the quality of the images that you use, and um, all, the, all the visual uh, parts that make the experience a pleasant one. So everything is in the details. Uh, even, you know, starting, I usually start with the logo and then with the, the colors that either the company already has or, um, you know, if they don't already have colors, we can kind of, you know, you suggest ones that are complementary to that. And you keep the colors down to, you know, just a couple of basic colors. Too much color, if everything has to pop, then you're just causing chaos for the eye. Because the, the goal when doing anything is to give the, the eye of the viewer a pathway to move throughout the website. So, you know, in, you I love know, that. in the I state, love that. yeah, in the states we start from the left and to the right. And so you kind of want to help them guide them across the page, you know, diagonally down, back across. So you end up with this like Z formation as you scan down the page. So everything needs to be, you know, kind of planned out so that your, um, the eye isn't trying to jump from one place to another, being confused as to where to go. And it's a subliminal thing that we all experience, but unless you're paying attention to it, it, um, it, is, it ends up being missed by, by people. So where yeah. like, I want everything above the fold. I got to have this up here, that up there. This has to pop. Make sure this pops, you know, and I'll make this red. And like, you have no red in your website, but you want it red so that it pops out. So, you know, there are other colors that will, you know, help something pop without having it to be, without it being red. So, yeah, and I, I find, um, and I love how you've got down here, like back in the day, store owners would make sure the sidewalk is clean first thing in the morning. They would, because a lot of people, they, you know, as we get into this digital age, it's very hard to, you know, uh, really understand. Maybe that's not the right phrase, but uh, it's hard to imagine how to create your website to where it's going to be effective. Uh, where back in the day, as you put it, it, it was very simple. You know, it, it, you only had your, you had your location, you had your brick and mortar store, and then you had to make it look presentable. And then whenever people walked into your store, you had to make it so that people went to certain areas in order to, to purchase things. And it's really the same thing, right? With the website and the layout is you want it to be really designed to help them get to where they want to go and make it easy for them to, to find uh, the product or service that they're looking to do. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that's why they put uh, peanut butter and jelly close to the bread, you know, as opposed to, you know, in a different aisle. You know, so I don't yeah. think a lot of people think about that with their website, whether they're doing it on their own or they're, they're doing that uh, with a developer like yourself. Um, you know, I, I don't think people, uh, they think about that. At least I, I didn't at first um, until uh, I really started digging in, into it. Um, and by the way, if anybody has questions, please feel free to tap them or put them in the chat here in the group. I'm monitoring that and we can hop on and answer those directly or utilize Richard to, to answer anything you've got going on with your specific business. Um, or you can raise your hand if you'd like to hop on and talk as well. So, um, but yeah, Richard, I really like how you've got that and kind of correlated back to what it was back in the day. And, and so people can start really visualizing what that looks like. Yeah, and it's really difficult for a business owner to, to do that because we get so caught up in running our running the business that it's hard for us to step out of that and see it as somebody completely new. And because uh, because I'm guilty of it myself, that's why I even you know uh, work with you know other designers to say, all right, you know, I'll have uh, one of the one of my own designers look at what I'm doing uh, for four wins just as an outside perspective. So, cause you always need that outside perspective to go, all right, what's your first thought? What are you, what are you thinking? So, um, so I'm good at doing that for everybody else. And I think, you know, but it's, it's just hard to do it for yourself. So as a business owner, you kind of want to hire somebody that's going to be able to step in and, 
inventory what you've got because a lot of times you have things you don't even realize. Yeah, okay. and, and wouldn't, wouldn't you, or, or maybe you wouldn't, I don't know, I don't mean to kind of uh, portray this but um, or project this, but wouldn't you recommend that even if they were doing it on their own or they were having somebody do it, maybe have an outsider come in and kind of do a test run to see how easy it is for them to find information or to achieve what they're looking to achieve whenever they go to the website? Yeah, that's a, that's a great idea. We end up doing that um, every once in a while. It just depends on the client and the, uh, the time that we have. A lot of times what we end up doing is, you know, a lot of times the client already has a website and then we'll build their new website on a, on a development site so that it's in the background, not accessible to Google. I mean, you'd have to have the URL to find it. So that's where we build it. And then uh, once we get to a certain point, then we, kind of shop it out to a couple of people that we know to say, all right, take a look at this just to verify, you know, does, is, is this making sense? Is this where you would expect to find it? And, um, you know, because we believe that you, know, you work in, in, in concert or, or in harmony with somebody as, you know, uh, it, it's, it's a collaborative um, approach to, to doing this because we're not, you know, I think anybody who walks in and goes, oh, I know exactly what you need. I know exactly what to tell you to do and, and do that. I would be a little weary of that because although, for instance, I know my profession uh, really well, I don't know my clients all that well. So it's a great opportunity for me to learn and see and be the outsider for a little bit. And then um, between uh, me and the client, we end up building something together and then as I've gotten to know it really well, then at that point, I do need somebody else to come in and take a look at it and go, all right, is this making sense that I fall in, you know, deeply with my clients so that I'm got their perspective as well. So. Yeah, no, that's all good stuff. And I want to make sure we stay on time here. So uh, move on to the next point, but I guess to end this with layout design is if anybody's like they're, they're starting to, to build their own website or work with somebody, would you, say kind of think of it as if you ha it was a brick and mortar store and how you would want that to look as if somebody were walking in off the street is kind of a, maybe a good starting point. I do. I think about, uh, I think about websites as um, either a house, an office or a grocery store. You That's know, awesome. I love, love that. So that, because you have, that way you've got a physical uh, mental image and, uh, and a lot of times I'll use uh, paper and pencil and uh, just one page for every web page so that I can, you know, write what I'd want on, you know, this page or that page. And so I've got an actual, I can actually move things around, you know, scribble stuff out, add stuff on. So that I'm actually building it visually. I'm a very visual person. So uh, that's why I need things like this, um, you know, thinking of it as a house or an office or, um, or a grocery store in order to, plan it out and kind of give uh, visitors uh, a pleasant experience when they come in. Awesome. Awesome. So right. which leads right into the next thing, which is content. The, everything that you're going to put into it. And it used to be content is king, but um, it's moving more toward context is king. Hmm. As, yeah. Dive into that a little bit. Yeah. Because, um, the whole point, the, the, the main focus that Google has, as well as any other search engine, is their primary goal is to get someone who's looking for, for information to the correct information. And so that's why they, you know, they create their database of everybody's website and categorize everything so that when you do a, a search for any uh, keyword or keyword phrase, they want to make sure they match that up to the right context. So that you, uh, it's all, so that it, you, when you, uh, a new per, when you search the internet, you're looking for you know a plumber, and uh, they're gonna uh, look at the context of all these plumbing websites to see, if it, you know how they can match best up to your search result, and they know it's a success when you end up staying on the website for you know more than you know five or 10 seconds. If you're on the website for about, for a few seconds and then start diving deeper in, 
to uh, more information, then Google knows they've served up the right person and it helps just solidify that website as a good resource for that keyword or that keyword phrase. If they go to that website and you bounce out immediately and you're back onto the search and going to the next one, then Google like reanalyzes how well they serve that up and they'll adjust where that website ranks in that search result. So the, um, so it's not a matter of just throwing a bunch of content into the website that you've got the word plumbing or Atlanta plumbing or Marietta plumbing or, you know, uh, pipe fittings and all that kind of stuff throughout the website. What matters is that you're, you've got the, uh, the meta description, right? You've got the headers, correct. You got the subheaders, correct. Because those work a lot like in a book when you've got, um, or, a, or, or a manual when you've got the headline for a section and each sub headline needs to refer to a headline. You can't have, you know, a headline of, you know, plumbing tools and then a sub headline of doggy toys. And, you know, Google's going to look at that and go, well, this doesn't match. I don't, what are you trying to push doggy toys to people who are looking for plumbing? That's an extreme example, but you know, there are, you know, um, websites that end up working, you know, gray hat or black hat techniques like that, trying to just drive more traffic to their website under any means possible yeah. just so that they get more traffic. And you would, and, and obviously black hat, that's something that we still see, unfortunately, um, as I'm sure you do as well. But if somebody's going to hire somebody like yourself, I mean, I think one of the biggest um, things that they should be looking out for is if, do they use uh, is ethical the right word or white hat or how, how would you, um, I guess, state that? Because I think it's important that people know who is setting up their website because essentially it could get them blacklisted, right? Uh, yeah. I mean, it, it, you could go up on a blacklist or, you know, Google can, Google can just kind of, you know, remove you from uh, their, their indexing because there are times when they'll, they'll, they'll remove you and they'll send the uh, owner of the website an email going, Hey, you know, this has happened because of this, you know, once you remedy that resubmit it, we'll take a look at it and then, you know, uh, we'll move on from there. So, yeah. you know, I think it, it nobody's going to tell you that they're using black hat or gray yeah. hat, you know, kind of thing. They're, they're, that was going to be my next question. I mean, how do people identify that? You know, how, or how do they guard themselves or their business? Because it could be pretty detrimental if, if you know, somebody's using um, those type of methods um, and they're not, uh, you know, on the up and up. Is there any way to spot that or kind of, or is it just go with somebody you trust? I mean, what, what, are, you, what are your thoughts? Well, I'm always weary of uh, people that make promises that they'll get you on the first page of Google in, you know, inside of a week. And uh, yeah. I'm, I'm kind of weary about that. It is possible to do that legally, in, or I, legally probably isn't the right word, but there is a way to do that ethically. And that's just through Google paid ads. And, uh, and then you bid on those uh, top positions on the page. So with that, but when you do the Google search, you'll, you'll see right next to the listing, a little, you know, ad symbol next to the top three or, you know, top uh, or the bottom three of a, of a search result. But, you know, you're paying for that. That is totally ethical. There's nothing wrong with that. And there's actually, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a valuable strategy in order to help get people to your website quickly. But the, the goal for most people is to get on, to the first page of Google organically. And there are ways to do that as well through um, just through making sure that your website is optimized very well. And to do that, you kind of want to target specific keywords that are related to, uh, to your industry, to your business. And uh, so you want to limit to just maybe a few keywords that you are, you're trying to uh, register for so that when they're doing that, you end up on the first page and then as, you know, or start climbing the ranks because usually, I mean, there are, 
uh, oh, I forgot the number, but there are uh, what, 7 million websites launched a day and uh, so, or 700,000 launched a day, something, I think there's 700,000 a day. And um, so there's a lot of noise out there. There's a lot of competition and, you know, I have no idea what all these people are doing launching that many websites, but you know, there's a ton going out there. And uh, so, but optimizing your website for a, just a few keywords and start with those first. And then as you gain uh, authority, then you start, you know, uh, working on other keywords to help move your site up in a broader, uh, broader range. But uh, and, you can, um, and just in case somebody may not know, what uh, explain keyword real quick. A keyword is basically when when you go to Google and you're uh, looking for pest control, you're going to type in, you know, pest control service or pest control this or you know, you know, kill my roaches. You know, you you're 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 going to put in something um, to try to find what you're looking for. Those are keywords and. Um, so the, sometimes um, the owner of a company or the marketing division of the company will already know the keywords that they want to rank for. Sometimes they don't. I work with, I work with quite a few small businesses that said, well, I think I just want this, this, and this. These are only you know, three or four things they could think of that somebody would use to search to find them. And so we use tools. There are free tools out there like um, uh, Google Planner, and uh, that you can use to come up with more keywords that are related. Because uh, I had, um, we were doing one website for an electrician, and what he they believed one of their keywords was outlets. And but you do a keyword uh, search on that to see kind of what comes up, and outlets refers to shopping outlets for more often than not. So we needed to change it to electrical outlets and uh, to help boost their website up. So doing a keyword search will help a lot. Uh, just coming up with, it'll tell you what the competition is, um, how many people search for it a month. And if you were to do any Google ads, how much it would cost you the uh, the range to compete up against other people who are using similar or same keywords to drive people to their website. So, um, so it's just a matter of that in a nutshell is uh, probably going to, I find it interesting, but it could bore you to tears as far as, um, well, let's um, definitely, I, I, like I said, I want to make sure we stay on time so that we can move on to the next one. But I believe uh, context, and I don't know if you agree, but the, the context is becoming more and more relevant and important because of voice search. Do you, yes. do you think that that is a yeah. big play into it in this, this day and age? Oh, yeah. I mean, with uh, Siri and uh, with uh, Google Voice, Alexa, and um, you know, they, there's so many things now that we are starting to, to do voice searches and Google is definitely paying attention to that. And yeah. they're paying attention to how well the website is optimized for, uh, for mobile devices. Yep. So um, all that is leading in, you know, to, um, so yeah, all that is very relevant. And that's why using, long tail keywords or, or keyword phrases is important because you know people are going to use it in a sentence and the longer tail keywords or the keyword phrases are going to end up helping you out uh, more often than not that's why it's good to incorporate them into uh, like the meta description and you know uh, sub headlines and into the body copy itself without but keeping in mind that you can't oversaturate it with keywords and Google will ding you for that. And there is uh, that you want to stay between 0.5 and 3% of your context needs to be the keyword that you're looking at. If they see that you've got 20% of your content is the keyword that you're trying to search for, Google will ding you for that going, all right, you're, you're a spammy site. So it's just one other thing that, 
uh, you can look out for as far as so really keep it simple, tell your story and um, be honest. Yeah. And be honest and you're good. I think that, that that's probably the best way to look at this. Right. Right. Yeah. And then let's move, let's move on to the next one. Cause like I said, I want to make sure we stay on, on um, topic here or on time. Yeah. The, it's, you know, talking about, you know, more people using mobile devices, one of the things it's it's um, I'm surprised these days that not every website is responsive, but if you're going to be effective, it has to be a responsive website. I mean, originally, uh, you know, it was just you would when the smartphones first came out before websites caught up to the the technology that was using them, the entire sh uh, website would shrink down to the size of the screen and you're looking at it on an iPhone or uh, uh, Android and you're looking at a three and a half inch screen, you've got a website that was designed for, you know, between uh, 14 and 21 inches down to three and a half inches. So you're zooming in on it. And then right after that, they came out with uh, what, what companies started doing was creating a separate web page just for mobile so that, everything would uh so a website would if it was if it was being viewed by a mobile device it would switch over to the second website that was designed for mobile so that it was uh larger the layout was different and uh it was easier to read and then then we get to the responsive website which is uh so now it's just one website you don't have two websites to manage but you just have one website that will resize depending on whatever screen you're looking at it on, whether you're looking at it on um, a tablet, uh, a smartphone, a website, doesn't matter. It's going to change the design and be ready. And that's one of the things that Google is looking at and they're uh, critiquing websites based on the desktop version and on the mobile diver on the mobile version. So as a designer, I get notices from, Google that such and such website on the mobile side, you know, this is, you know, too close to that, you know, it makes for a bad experience. And so we go in and make sure it's adjusted correctly and, uh, you know, things like that. But it's now are uh, most um, like, so if somebody's building their own website or just trying to, or just trying to get something up or most going to be set up to do this in this day and age. But yeah. Yeah, these days, okay. uh, if you're doing your own website, if you're using um, uh, a WordPress theme, or if you're using Wix, or um, uh, you know all these other different uh, website builders, yep. they're all set that they will be responsive websites. I will tell you, I think it's on Wix. There, they've got it's not uh, responsive by default. You have to go into the menu settings and look, and there's a little button you've got to click in order to make it uh, a responsive design. So it's, you know, they that's do have- weird. I mean, that's, that's weird that they would do that, but um, it, yeah. it is what it is, right? It's good, that's yeah. good information to know. That's very valuable. Yeah, I mean, it's one of the things, because I, I end up uh, helping clients that they do have their website on Wix, and you know they they reach out to me and you know can you help do this and uh, so I've had experience in quite a few platforms and and uh, so yeah I was surprised that it wasn't by that way by default so but the, the these days just about everybody already has a website but if your website is you know five six years old or older the chances of being responsive aren't as high as you might think and. Um, I was actually looking at a website this past week that ended up giving me the uh, the little warning that you know, I have to enable the Flash plugin for it to work, for the website to work. And Flash is part of a programming language that, you know, is rarely used anymore. It's outdated. And so, which tells me this website is close to 10 years old and uh, needs to be redesigned. So... And, 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 I love that. Yeah, it's not going to be responsive. And um, so, yeah, it's just 
you know, we've been building websites for, you know, the web has been around since uh, the late 80s. The first website went up in the early 90s. So we're going on almost 30 years of people building websites. And uh, there's been a lot of growth, um, especially since the uh, smartphone came out. There's been a lot of, a lot of changes and a lot of growth. And uh, so it, it's just, it's fascinating. It's always changing. And, you know, we actually refresh our website every two to three years, uh, update the design. Because Is that what you would recommend for, for most companies? Yeah. I mean, I, w I would not go more than five years without uh, refreshing your design because design gets dated quickly. Yeah. And it's one of those subliminal things, you know, that, you know, that you've got to stay on top of because people will look at it and go, Oh, this is so like 2003 or, you know, this is, this is definitely an older site, but you can tell by the fonts, you can tell by the, um, you know, the colors or the layout, especially, I mean, cause there was a time where everybody had a sidebar and now, you know, nobody has a sidebar. It's all, you know, uh, full width, you know, clean design, lightweight. You want it to look, um, fresh and uh people have a tendency of thinking that everything needs to stay um uh, you don't want to change anything because of brand recognition and that's not necessarily true companies change their logo all the time you know starbucks they just changed their logo what year year and a half ago they made changes to it and starbucks has gone through several iterations of their logo and uh, over the course of their uh They've been around for what, 15 years, 20 years, something like that. Yep. Google, Google has changed their logo. There's been changes. So companies are constantly refreshing their look, trying to stay uh, relevant. So, yeah, I wouldn't go, I would not go more than five years without updating the website. And a lot of times, depending on how the website was built, you don't need to rebuild it in order to freshen up the look. And uh, I, we ended up building ours on a platform that, you know, I actually built the website five, six years ago, seven, about six, over six years ago, built the first iteration of the website. And I've changed it three times now without having to rebuild the website. And um, so. Well, that's good info. I want to make sure, um, cause 348 right now, let's go ahead and get to, to the next one. But the five years, that's something that I've always wondered, like what was a good, um, mark and five years is a great thing to kind of have in the back of your mind, but probably two to three years to, to really start really looking at it. So, yeah, I would say like every two to three years, start planning. You go, all right, let's, let's start looking at what we need to do. Cause it, you know, it, depending on the size of the website, it could take, you know, it could take with some websites, it'll only take maybe a month or so other websites. It could take the better part of six months, you know, to, to redesign and freshen the look up just depends on the size of the website. Awesome. And then another thing that um, we want to help that it's a good thing to, um, like I said earlier on engaging with your, your visitors is to offer them something for free because like I said, context is king. So people are, they're on the web, they're looking for, for information. They want help for uh, doing this, doing things uh, with so many people wanting to do things on their own that it's good to be able to help them out. And I don't mean, you know, giving away trade secrets or anything like that. There's a lot of times you would gladly just over the phone or you know, you're talking to somebody, you'll gladly give them advice about, oh, you want to make sure you, you know, keep the shrubs this far away from the house, you know, make sure they don't do this because you don't want bugs getting on the wall, creating a, you know, a trail of ants to find a crevice in your wall and, you know, things like that. So there's a lot of information that you may not even be aware that you offer to people for free that you can put together either in a quick video or better yet, something that they can download and uh, like, a schedule as far as when to water the lawn or, you know, when to fertilize, you know, you, you see it's free on the back of uh, different 
fertilizing packets that show you like when's the best time to use this when's the best time to do that and you know you're going to know that for your industry if you work in the hair industry there are things you're going to tell your clients like when you start seeing this you know switch over to this shampoo or come in for this treatment or, or do that you know there's a lot of things that you're going to end up providing so it just gives you a way to help provide information for uh, people out there looking for it. And if you become a good resource, they're going to come back to you and they're going to start trusting you more, especially if the advice you're giving them is good and authentic. So that's the part where content was the big thing and because you want to be able to provide information to people. And, um, yeah, that's one thing we always we always talk about as well is obviously give some stuff away to to incentivize people to um, to really either give you their information because it's all about building up your database and a call to action um, as well. So um, definitely a, a good topic and a good point here. Do you have any anything specific as far as? You, that you've seen work best for businesses or maybe a service related business or somebody doing anything that pops out or stands out? Usually doing, um, you know, like either off, offering a coupon of some sort or, you know, a reduced rate for, you know, um, a, a routine service call, like for a um, HVAC company, if they put something out there, you know, you know, we'll do a service call for, you know, you know, fifty nine ninety five. We'll come out. And, you know, check your Freon. You know, uh, check this, check that, and um, you know. Do you those think it's kind of, better for them to? Sorry to cut you off. Um, uh, do you think it's better for them to put like a a deadline on it, make it like an incentive for like a limited time offer, or just have something that's pretty evergreen? Well, I will tell you that it. Uh, a couple of years ago, I would have said, yeah, definitely put. Uh, an expiration date on it because you want to try to uh, elicit some sort of, you know, you got to get it or lose it kind of thing. But lately I've been reading and I've been watching that that isn't working as well as it used to. And yeah. that if you are, because uh, that they will appreciate it more if you're like, Hey, you know, th we'll honor this for, you know, for as long as, you know, we're in business or we have this product or whatever, you know, I think uh, do a little balancing act of both. And, um, you know, it depends on the service and, you know, the product that you have. Obviously, for some products, you only have a, if you're doing a product, you only have a limited amount. So you're going to have to to do that. But if it's, if it's a service, then uh, you could do it seasonally. Like, you know, summer has just started. So, it's a great way to you know theme it so that you get more people going ahead and calling you up for any HVAC service during this time of year, and then you know different service when the weather is cooler. And you can actually run the same thing when the weather is cooler. Like, hey, you know, you're not thinking about your AC right now, so now is the perfect time. You know, we have you know this special rate during the fall. You know, because your business, you may be not, you may not be as busy during the fall, you know, because people's ACs aren't breaking down. So, you know, I would do seasonal stuff, but, um, you know, but, you yeah. know, yeah. like I said, it's been a mix, uh, you know, a, a while ago, I would definitely said, yeah, it's got to be that way. But these days, I think people are, the team. are kind of, they're, they're kind of tired of that. Yeah. Well, so, let's um, let's move, go ahead and move to the next one because I know we've got about six minutes, and I want to make sure we touch on that, and then um, if there happen to be any Q and A on here uh, as well. Okay, yeah. So it's uh, just to recap real quick. It was um, you know the layout design was important, context is important, um, having a responsive design is important, the uh, the freebies. Are I think are are important, and the last thing is to to grow the site to actually pay attention to it. So many people will build the site, and then are like, all right, that's done, and then they move on. They're they're running their business, and they they're not thinking about their website. And because they're not thinking about their website, their website isn't actually 
producing anything for them. And your website can be a really good producer as far as um, leads, as far as leads are concerned and engagement. Like I said, you know, you know over 60% of people use your a website to contact you either chat, texting, or email. So to growing your site, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's been around for a long time, but it's still relevant, and that is to create a blog. You can name it current news or what's happening or, you know, industry update, whatever you name it, it's basically a blog that you want to keep you know, putting information out there. This is the content part of it. You want to have good context within it, but you want to grow the site. The more pages your website has, the more there is for Google to index and serve up for anybody who is searching. So if you are, if you have a hair salon, for instance, I mean, you've got topics all the time that you can be talking about, whether it's, you know, treatments, colorings, cuts, uh, you know, taking care of, you know, different types of cuts. So you could have, you know, one blog about one particular cut, another blog about another, you know, style. Because, you know, with that industry, it's like design. It's constantly changing, constantly evolving. So there's no shortage of what you could write about. It's just a matter of being consistent. And, and it needs to, uh, you can work in the, the keywords that you want to, and you can grow the keywords so that, you know, like I said, you don't want to stack too many within your website, but as your blog grows, you can continue to spread those keywords throughout those pages, adding more keywords that people would use because when someone is searching for something, Google doesn't always serve up the home page. They'll serve up an article inside of a page if it's more relevant to what the search is uh, in reference to. So if they, uh, we have one client that they end up going to uh, one of their market pages before they go to the home page. So, and uh, so we started throwing in little house ads onto that market page so people would go further into the website and explore different areas of what uh, this uh, organization has to offer. So, Growing your site is important. You can't just, you know, put it out there and just leave it alone and expect it to always be relevant and always be engaging it uh, because your competition is always out there looking to grab more of a piece of the pie. So you need to stay vigilant. And one thing they recommend is no less than 1,000 words for a blog post. They recommend closer to 2,000 words for a blog post. And um, just so that there's enough content in there. And, um, but it's from what I've been watching and reading, Google really likes, you know, uh, articles closer to the 2000 mark. So uh, I, wow, I did not, did not realize that. So that's, um, that's actually a really, really good tip uh, because it's important. It's important to keep that. And then it's good to know, you know, obviously Google is, they would, promote a blog within a page than, you know, sometimes the actual website itself, which is pretty cool. I had no idea about that. Yeah. And it's something you can do yourself. I mean, especially if you have a, a, a WordPress or Wix site or something like that, you can go in, do it once a month, once a week, once a week would be the best, but you know, I know it takes time out of your, your day, but spend that time, write something about the industry. Do not copy and paste something from somebody else because Google will compare and um, your article to other articles and they will see if you plagiarize something. I mean, you can be inspired by something else and rewrite it, you know, in, in your own words, but don't go out there and start, you know, taking something from somebody else because Google is sophisticated. They watch out for that kind of stuff and you'll get dinged by it. Yep. That's uh, well, we're right at four o'clock. So if there's any questions, feel free to put them in the chat. In the meantime, I'm going to, I will always like to close off with one big tip. So I'm going to put you on a, I'm probably going to put you at, um, on the spot here, Richard, but what is the biggest thing that you find with small businesses, people that are maybe doing startups, maybe it's big businesses that you see the most 
but is very easy to fix. Like the biggest issue that hurts a small business whenever you go and look on their website or maybe you're doing an audit, what is the biggest thing you see being missed and it's easily corrected and maybe it, it probably is a pet peeve of yours, I'm sure. Uh, it's basically, it's a lack of use of their keywords. I mean, that, that's a big one because a lot of times, you know, they're writing the stuff themselves and they'll use words like, you know, we did this and our company does that and we do it here and, and they'll use um, uh, pronouns more than and when they have a great opportunity to use their keywords, they'll use a pronoun and um, and, and and blow opportunities because it's it's very simple to use the keywords you know to, just to look at the the title of your page, the headline of your page, the sub headlines of different topics within the page, and you know just rewrite it using the keywords that you want to use. I mean, that's, that's one of the biggest, easiest ones to do. And, um, so and then, key, keyword usage. Keyword usage is big. And then, um, yeah, that, that, there's, that could be a whole section just on that. And, uh, yeah, so, but that's good to know. I mean, that's good. And it's kind of a good thing to, to leave everyone with here. Um, you know, obviously keyword is, is huge and you need to make sure that you've got it properly within the, the site and that it's doing what it's supposed to be doing or you're going to be leaving money on the table. Exactly. Yeah. You're leaving it all there for your competition you know, who is, you know, using the keywords to get as many people onto their website as possible. And like I said, it's something that you can do. It's something that um, you, because you're the one writing it. So take advantage of it. No, that's awesome. Well, that's, uh, we're right at four o'clock here. So, um, you know, Richard, thank you so much for hopping on and spending time and going through this and uh, everybody it's going to be recorded and on the website. So if you want to go back and check anything out, please feel free to do so. But thanks for attending and everyone who attended uh, throughout and couldn't stay for the whole thing. Um, and anybody watching this recorded. So if you have any questions, Richard, where can they ask you questions where they can find you? Um, because I know you're happy to answer questions uh, just to help people out, especially within the community. So where can they do that? Uh, yeah, if you just go to our website, fourwindsagency.us. Uh, it's just like you see it on the screen, uh, fourwindsagency.us. Go there, and I've got the contact form. I've got um, a button to schedule an appointment. So I'm happy to sit down and talk to anybody at any time, either via phone, video conference, or in person if you're in the uh, Atlanta area. Then um, I also have this uh, presentation, uh, the five characteristics, characteristics of effective websites on the webpage that you can download as well. It's one of the freebies that I tell you that you should be doing. It's what I've got. It's uh, pretty simple and easy to do. So you can go check it out and see how you might, you know, do something like this for yourself. That's awesome. Yeah, definitely take advantage of that. And like I said, feel free to reach out to Richard if you need any help or just questions about the site, or if you just want them to take a look and make sure you're using keywords properly or um, layouts there. He, I can tell you from working uh, with him in the past is, um, you know, one of the best that we've, we've come across. So thanks again, Richard. And uh, thanks again for everybody tuning in and look forward to, um, I guess, talking again in the future. Thanks, Brandon. Appreciate it. Absolutely.